Okay, great. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, on. Nathan. Um, do you prefer Alex, Alexander, yeah. doctor, or professor? Alex, yeah. Okay. Um, so you're a doctor rerum naturalum? Is that how you pronounce Dr. it? Dr. Rernat, yeah, exactly. That's Latin. Yeah, I okay. have a PhD in physics, as you would oh, say okay, in Canada. Yes. Yeah. Um, so where is, how'd you get the, the other title? Or, what, um, Dr. Why? Rernat? No. Oh, I, uh, I was educated in Germany. Went to high school, to, mm -hmm. did my master's, or the, as they're called, diploma, and then my PhD in, in Germany. And then I left to spend five years as it was called a postdoc and an assistant professor mm. in the US in Louisiana and then I came to Canada in 2000. <laughs> You've been, been around as yeah. far as school goes. Yeah. Uh, what made you come, what, did, did you come over for school from Germany or what was it? I came over after doing some research and, and being it was called an assistant professor. The typical faculty ranks in, in Canada or North America are assistant professor, associate professor and full professor. So. Mm. Um, I came here actually because of the Canadian Light Source, uh, which yes. is what I use for research, and they needed in 2000, they needed uh, people to do research and use this facility um, as a research tool. And mm -hmm. since I had done my master and my PhD and also my postdoctoral work in Louisiana at various synchrotrons, I uh, came here. It was mm -hmm. a great offer, an interesting place. I never knew uh, actually i had to look up where saskatchewan is <laughs> to <laughs> yeah. admit this now <laughs> yeah uh, before i came here the first time so i didn't know and then i came from louisiana and i remember in november of 2019 i started in, in june july 2020 so i came for the interview and it took me from the airport to the hotel the forgot now the park town or whatever it was yeah. called and I had already chapped lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> dry. I lived yeah. Five years in, <laughs> yeah. uh, and in November it was already freezing. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, it gets so cold. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I like it here. Have you, have you been enjoying it? Or oh yeah. It, yeah. I, otherwise, I wouldn't be. I'm now here 22 years. Yeah, sure. and I enjoyed. Yeah. I also became Canadian citizen which was something I did basically only during COVID because yeah, yeah. I never got around to it before. And uh, yeah, so I like it a lot. It's, um, I live on a small acreage. For When I came here, I looked actually around at different yeah. acreages. I had a real estate agent. He drove me to yeah. acreages and they were like up to 80 acres. This was to a German that uh, or a person who grows up in mm. Europe is incomprehensible. Yeah, when you cannot see the, 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 the border of your property. Yeah. So it was difficult in that way. But I have now only six acres, but I always like to uh, say that I send typically postcards to my friends in Germany or so where somebody is standing at the end of a property and then I say yeah. something along the lines that only the Queen of England in, <laughs> in Europe or now the King uh, live under such uh, such conditions. Yeah, okay. I think the, the saying is in Saskatchewan, you could run, watch your dog run away for five days. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Also, people, uh, it's funny that uh, recently an old a friend of mine wrote to me, she was going with her family to uh, Vancouver and to Banff, uh, living in Saskatoon. So she said to me, she wrote me the dates when she would be in Vancouver and whether we could uh, wanted to chat in the evening. Yeah? So I had to tell her that basically going to Vancouver is basically twice the distance from yeah. Hamburg to Paris or going to... Uh, basically, it can easily be like going to, when I do, would drive to Toronto, it's like going to Greece from mm -hmm. Germany. Yeah? So the distances are incomprehensible for yeah. people in Europe. I didn't know that until I was in high school. I just, nobody, I yeah. just had never thought of it. And people were like, yeah, it's not that far, like of a drive to get anywhere in Europe. And I was yeah. like, who smokes? It takes forever to get anywhere yeah. over here. So, Well, yeah. the, the traffic is actually very mild. Yeah? Yeah. Basically nothing when you go to a city of Calgary or so. But the... The point is, if you go to Calgary, you have a few small towns. You want to know how people in Kindersley mm -hmm. or so. You have a few towns you go through. But in Germany, you would basically only recognize uh, that you have entered another city by the sign that you have to observe. There's sign after sign. Mm -hmm. You don't even, if you only go by the landscape or the houses or the population, you, you couldn't tell when you leave one oh, city okay. and go into the next one. Yeah. yeah so it's quite different. I, was, I noticed that in, I was in um, Miami. I was in Fort Lauderdale and yeah. we drove from Fort Lauderdale to Miami yeah. and um, we didn't leave the city exactly. the one, like once, but we were going, yeah. we went through, I think a couple, but yeah, yeah. you're just in one. Exactly. You have to state. always watch the sign yeah. uh, of where the new city starts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you came over for the, this, the synchrotron. Yeah, exactly. Can yeah. you, can you explain what that is? 
Yeah. yeah, it's basically like I would say a large uh, microscope. So the the first thing I will try to make it short in terms of the physics. So the long answers the, are great. The, you can the get first as the first want. aspect to know is um, when you so what it does is it has electrons that are circulating in the storage ring as it's called, and they have basically the speed of light. So mm -hmm. they are called what's called relativistic electrons. And there's one principle that you don't learn in physics in school in high school, and that is that when radiation is accelerated, then it gives off energy in terms of radiation. Yeah. In the beginning, this was actually a nuisance to the, the first people that built storage rings to have particles collide and find out what the what matter is basically made of and find all the fragments like quarks and, and so forth. Um, those people wanted to answer the question, what is matter made of? And then of course this has philo philosophical implications and so forth. To these people, it was a nuisance because mm. they had to put in more energy because the energy of the accelerated charged particles was actually given off in radiation. So mm. they could in the beginning, well, they understood it but pretty quickly, but it was something that they wouldn't have, rather would not have had. Of course, you cannot fit it with Mother Nature, so it's a physical principle. However, later it was recognized that the radiation has very specific properties. Okay. And uh, this properties of the radiation is used for many things. So today at the University of Saskatchewan, there's basically no area from agriculture to biology, to physics, to chemistry, computer science, to medicine, of course. There's no area where the synchron is not uh, involved in its no. use. So what it really does is it gives of radiation. And the first thing to know about the radiation, unlike a laser, which is pretty much one wavelength and has a very narrow bandwidth, or unlike an x-ray tube that you go to your doctor to have an x-ray with, with a specific uh, anode uh, radiation, copper or molybdenum or something, the synchron has an incomprehensibly large range of wavelength oh, or energies. Okay. Yeah. And so from infrared to the visible, to the soft x-rays, to the hard x-rays, um, all this radiation is available. And now the, the last idea that I wanted to convey is, um, the shorter the wavelength or the higher the energy of the radiation, the more detail you can actually basically get. So, for example, a light microscope has something in the order of 400 to 800 visible radiation, nanometer radiation. And this radiation can give you details in the order of the wavelength or you can resolve structures that are in the order of the wavelength. So maybe wow. uh, something in like 400 nanometers good optical microscopes can do a little bit better. So the idea is if you now make the wavelength shorter, you will be able to see more detail. So suddenly instead of uh, resolving um, fine structures on the surface, human hair, things like that, you can see suddenly, um, depending on how, how high you tune uh, the energy, you can suddenly see uh, subatomic structures mm. or in my case, the electronic structure of material. So you, um, the size of, um, say proteins you can Im oh, wow. Im uh, image. So there's a very, very large uh, range of applications mm. of this. The idea is you have a very wide energy range in terms of the radiation that is given off. And now you can use at each, what's called beam line at each station where people do experiments, you can use a different range of that radiation for your experiments. And the, the energy or the wavelength of this radiation determines pretty much what you're looking at, whether you're looking at molecules, whether you're looking at atoms, whether you're looking at materials, so there's mm. a, whether you look at medicine, yeah. Is it the, the smaller wavelengths show you on uh, more precise structures? Is that because they're... Yeah, the more you can resolve, basically, yeah. Is that yeah. because the, since the wavelength is shorter, it's more likely to uh, reflect off of... No, okay. it has to do with a principle that's not so well known and that is called diffraction. So you see, um, the bottom line is, and in layman's language, is you can, with optical spectroscopy, or no, spectroscopy, with, optic, with uh, normal optics, you can only resolve approximately the structure that is the wavelength uh, of the light. So this is the same thing. Let me make a normal deal. Let's say you have a tennis court in your backyard and you have fine hair cracks due to the weather in Saskatchewan. Mm. So the hair cracks, which are typically in the order of microns, or thousands of millimeters, you wouldn't even recognize when you play tennis. So now you need a finer tool than a tennis ball to see how fine the cracks are. So you, for example, oh, of course, yes. you could. So the 
The problem is why it cannot be explained um, in, in layman's language so easily. Once the wavelength of the radiation gets roughly into the size of the object that you want to look at yeah, or the dimensions that you want to resolve, mm. then a principle kicks in that's not geometric optics anymore. It's called diffraction. Diffraction is something when you take a slit, they, you know, in, in high school, maybe you've seen that then suddenly that the radiation yeah. gives, it doesn't follow just straight lines anymore, the yeah. light. It suddenly has diffraction properties. So, for example, it will be decomposed into wavelength and um, there are different principles at work that are not so uh, common knowledge, I think, of course, for any physics student, but not for a person that has yeah. you know, taken one class in high school in physics. Yeah. Yeah. So then there's light is not only going in straight lines, it uh, has actually also, it's called the duality, it has all, it shows wave and, and particle mm. uh, structure at the same time, right. which is yeah, one yeah. of the accomplishments yeah. of, of quantum mechanics to establish mm -hmm. this, this duality. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anything about that stuff, yeah. but I, I've, like, I've just like, when I read or come across it, it always fascinates me. I remember hearing that for the first time that light moves sometimes like a particle and sometimes, or it behaves sometimes yeah. like a particle. Exactly right. Like yeah. That. So it depends yeah. actually on the, uh, the, this is actually really a reminder of, for any physicist, that whatever you do, whatever you do to observe something, you will affect and Im impose mm -hmm. on the object that you're observing. So it depends actually on the setup. You can have some experiments. Um, for example, these diffraction experiments, when you take a slit or you can take even a small object, let's say you take your umbrella, which is woven of some material, there are fine slits in there, right. you hold this against the light, you will sometimes see if, you, if the dimensions oh, are right, okay, you yeah. will see how it decomposes into light, you, yeah. it look like the, the rainbow colors are decomposing. Wow. You see that, yeah? this is the, the diffraction principle, so that in that case, this can only be explained when uh, the wave na nature of the light is mm. uh, taken into account. But then there are others like Einstein's uh, most famous uh, photoelectric effect, which he got the Nobel Prize for in 1921, I believe. So that show where light shows uh, the particle nature. So it's mm. not that depending on the con it's basically the co depending on the conditions you choose with your observational experiment what the nature uh, of light or what nature of light the particle or the wave nature will appear or will, it will show. That's so fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it was of course difficult for the people uh, in the beginning you know, in quantum mechanics when you take this a step further then mm -hmm. this was all 1921 and it started before and then went to 19 whatever 45 maybe Pauli principle Nobel Prize so and this were the golden age uh, of, of quantum mechanics and you know that people had a struggle in the beginning to cope with the fact that uh, Einstein had this famous saying, God doesn't roll the dice when, uh, you know, anything becomes only a likelihood or mm. a matter of likelihood, whether some atom is there or there. You know, yeah. when, you, when you shrink the dimensions of the objects and it comes to quantum mechanical, basically atomic size uh, dimensions, then matter and, and everything else, all the laws of physics behave very differently. Yeah. yeah. It's like a completely different realm. Yeah. And there's lots of science fiction based on that because it is, it's, it's so it's <laughs> mind blowing. Like I can't wrap yeah, my head yeah. around it. So yeah. Well, I remember that uh, my graduate students in the beginning always invited me, and we watched a number of movies where um, you know when they try to stress physics, <laughs> yeah, uh, to claim some some causality in some science fiction movies, and we, we always I remember that we always got only good laughs out of yeah. it because it was little off and rarely made sense. Although the people I'm sure had physicists advising them, mm -hmm. it was really not holding true. Is it hard to watch films like that, knowing all those things, like when you know they're making up words and like... Oh, no, I no, not at all. I don't think so. I mean, I, you can ask basically any policeman who watches a crime story, yeah, which is true. more more yeah. evident, I think, probably than or more, more frequent or more common than, uh, than those, than science fiction movies. Yeah. You can ask them whether how they solve the case. Is this reasonable? I would think mm -hmm. they also say most of the time that's totally... Yeah, I think uh, unreasonable is. because whatever there's a huge administration that you have to follow there's all kinds of other mm -hmm. things yeah and i guess at some point you have to suspend your disbelief right so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i must admit that i'm not a fan of science fiction movies but it's <laughs> not because of my physics background i find always that normal life gives so many fascinating stories that i don't mm -hmm. have to go to some totally absurd uh, awesome. time yeah. and, and space uh, scenario to find something that is interesting yeah. very cool 
And so you use the light source to yeah. study electronic uh, structures? So to exactly. Perfectly right. Okay. Yeah. So we look at the electronic structure. So we look at, uh, for example, you may have heard of graphene, um, which was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2010, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, that was a monolayer of certain uh, uh, carbon atoms that are arranged in a certain way. So we look at how atoms um, arrange, how they bond, um, what the properties are and then of course ultimately we want to take this to some some applications mm. yeah so that is uh, always the most difficult part for people i get often called by by journalists or what, once a month or so and then there's always i've come i've became i became a little tired of it because <laughs> Um, I always say now as an entry uh, to our the conversation, I'm not uh, uh, researching fireproof underwear and I don't cure cancer. Do you still want to talk to me? Yeah, mm -hmm. Because people expect that the time from the discovery that you're making to the having it implemented in an industrial product is like a week. Yeah, yeah. So what very I short, research yeah. today, people want to have tomorrow in their toaster. Mm -hmm. Of course, in real life, the uh, time span is extremely fast in some of our research and in, in LED research, which we do for lighting, the, the, the time would be four years from having the material for the first time to having it actually in a light bulb. Yeah. yeah so that's very fast. Yeah. Yeah. When well, you can't make a complicated thing simple, right? So. Yeah, yeah. It is also, there's a lot of steps one has to go through. One has to, of course, understand it first. And yeah, there's a lot of steps involved. That's yeah. the main problem. But people become, have grown so impatient because of, you know, Twitter, all these messages, everything has to be short and fast. And uh, when you look at uh, the electron microscope or the tunneling microscope, uh, earth uh, shattering discoveries that mm -hmm. were made. And when you look at how long it took minimum 20 years from discovery to having an industrial product. Yeah. So one should not only because we are in fast paced times be so impatient today. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, okay. Do you prefer not to interact with the uh, public then because of those? No, I, I like, I do it actually a lot. I, I go to high schools. I give oh, actually, yeah. Ne uh, yeah, next month, I, yeah, next month I go to, to Bethlehem high, high School and give talks Very there. Cool. So I try to yeah. fascinate young people uh, with, the, with the laws of physics and mm -hmm. how this all is. They often not, uh, don't have a good um, imagination of what this is like. So in all, all aspects. But of course, it's people that write articles, they should know a little bit better because you know that always starts with a little bit of research. Even finding a topic you want to write about yeah. involves already some research. So I would think that um, it is of course true that also in funding, for example, when, when somebody wants to get money for a project, you need to also sell this point and stress the point, why is this important? Every yeah. proposal as a section, why is this important to Canada? Yeah, that's very clear. So one cannot forget about it. But at the same time, I don't need to write that I will have it tomorrow implemented in some device. Yeah. Yeah, so it will, it is enough to show that this is of fundamental interest, for example, and could possibly lead to a project. Nobody knows in research what it will end up to, uh, add up with. Yeah. Mm. Is it just, do you and your whole team work on all these projects or is it just you or? No, no, it's my, uh, actually I'm the person I would call it the godfather, jokingly. <laughs> I'm the one who uh, has the idea what, which, which, which system to study. Mm. I need to, of course, get the funding. So in, in physics, unlike in other areas, in, in the many natural sciences, uh, the graduate students are paid a salary. Yeah. Um, rightfully so, because they do really all the legwork. So there is a lot of aspects we need to travel um, say to the conferences or even before the CLS to synchrotrons. Um, we need to purchase things. We need to have computers. So there's a lot of funding involved. They have to, students have to live and they have to have a salary. So I, I the money, uh, monetary aspect is one big thing. Then there's of course also the aspect one needs to find people that becomes increasingly uh, difficult uh, to find good graduate students. So uh, you mentioned that the first time we met, you said that you're finding it's harder to keep people around. A little uh, bit. Not so much to keep around to even find. I yeah. every day now I spend. I have a website, and uh, from all over the world, people are applying. But um, what the, is the website? The, the website is uh, beamteam.usask.ca. Okay. So it's all kinds of. Cool stuff, by the way, I always point this out, say to high school students, if you're interested in physics, for example, it shows 
not only a glorification of what we do, but mm. uh, it's not a glorification of what we do. It has also all the, the say, prizes or accomplishments of the right. graduate students. So there's a section beam team in the news where oh, we cool. go through all the highlights. So, of course, the whole idea is that it attracts other students that they can see when you join uh, our group, the beam team. One of my earlier students, uh, Sam Leach, he, he phrased that uh, or coined that phrase. So <laughs> it's uh, now we've become basically the beam team. So that's, that's awesome. really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the, there's a lot of aspects. So the, the bottom line of, of what I'm saying is really that the graduate students really do all the work. Yeah? So yeah. They, we, we publish, of course, papers. They will be authors. Yeah. of those papers they will drive the research so i'm the one i meet with them we discuss the results i try to steer them in the right direction i provide the funding but uh, really um, without graduate students there would be no research that's very clear so yeah, I, if you ask me whether i do this <laughs> all of my students it's at best we both do it but clearly all the credit should go to the graduate students yeah. and it does when they uh, write a paper they will be authors and even corresponding authors. So this is clear yeah. that uh, it's not only that they get their degree, they get more. They get to show to the community, their peers, as it's called. They get to show that they have not only at the University of Saskatchewan level, but at a national, international level, they have uh, done work that is worthwhile being reviewed and yeah. then being accepted. So this is more than just getting a degree. Publications are important to show that you have done something on a world level, yeah, on an international level, not only at the level to satisfy some person here at our university. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, they're very lucky to have you as a supervisor. You're making like me excited about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, of course, that is also why I give these talks to, um, uh, say, in high schools, and I give uh, not anymore because uh, CLS has restricted that. But I used to give a lot of tours to people at the uh, synch uh, of the synchrotron right. to, to excite uh, people um, to, to share yeah. my excitement it always rubs off you know I'm fairly animated when I speak I also think I try to make clear where the applications are and what this at large is for not only some nitty gritty detail yeah. uh, about some technic technological aspect yeah, so that is yeah. really and I think that rubs off um, I give my, my talks for example <laughs> Can tell you um, that I, next week I will. I'm often asked to give what's what they call the people that ask me a motivational talk. Yeah. Why is it good to be in physics? How can your life look like? And what I find, what I connect with um, when I go to a high school, I always ask, what is it? What you want to do with your life? And there are two things that I always hear from all the students. One is they want to do something that helps society or, or does something that's worthwhile doing, not mm -hmm. just uh, being in charge of some letter A to K and some uh, unvented poor basement and uh, whatever, mm -hmm. and administering that. They want to do something that matters. That's the first thing. And the other thing is they want to ideally also do something that's unique. Mm -hmm. and so then I always ask them what is unique. And strange enough, um, it hasn't happened during COVID because I couldn't uh, give any talks. But before COVID, there was always one or two people in each class that said, like, going on climbing Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. So I've now incorporated this in my uh, talks. And I have a picture uh, where on May, in May, sometime in May 2016, there is a picture of how the people get to, this, to the summit. That yeah. day, uh, there were over 150 people that reached Mount Everest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to convey is <laughs> it's not as unique as you may think. No. Yeah. So writing a paper in physics <laughs> is already much uh, equally unique. It is much less dangerous, by the way. Yeah. You know, there are 200 people that have died. Uh, uh, it's lying with bodies. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. and only on that day. In fact, I looked it up. I think that year um, Forgot now the number, but there there have been close to the uh, si uh, small cities population of people that have oh, been on uh, Mount Everest. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I've seen that photo they're talking about. Yeah. They're all just like back to back. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what my point is. It can be actually equally or even more unique. That's mm. my point to, to write a physics paper and, ga and yeah, ga no, get sure. engaged in this. It's much, much less dangerous. It's even much less expensive. You know, I don't want a tour <laughs> to the summit costs. I would say minimum $30,000 you have to Yeah, I'm up. sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Did you <laughs> did you always know that you wanted to uh, do this then? Always oh, no, no, it was actually quite different. You know, there, there are, especially in physics, there are a lot of people who know already at age, whatever, 10, yeah. uh, what they want to do, that they want to become an engineer or doing something like this. I didn't know that. I When I was 16 and in high school, I started to pick up guitar playing and I thought I would become a guitar uh, musician and uh, that was something that I thought much to the dismay of my mother who <laughs> thought always I would end up uh, accomplishing nothing. I was only caring about my guitar, the, the crucial years in high school when you want to finish. Yeah, yeah. So I put all this aside and dedicate. And so I thought after that I uh, would, whatever, as I say, always grow my hair long, become a guitar guru and go to India or something. That was my, my, my envisioning of what I wanted yeah. to do then. But then I, in Germany, it was at the time mandatory to join the army mm. and the, this is not a professional army like in Canada. So then it turned out for, in my case, that um, you do basically even the, the, any person recognize after four weeks that um, what you do, you train. Of course, the, the task of the army to preserve the peace is in everybody's favor, but mm -hmm. uh, for the daily uh, work, in a um, mandatory uh, army, not a professional army, is very uh, boring in the sense that you use equipment, afterwards you clean it, and then you use it again. Yeah, so basically you're creating always your own work. Mm. That was a little bit of a problem because you know if you don't go out the next day and practice, you may also not have to clean the, uh, the next day after. Oh, so see. it was yes. always like yeah. this, it was producing your own, um, your own work. So after that I felt, Man, this cannot go on. Uh, that I need to do something, and then I mm -hmm. basically picked physics. I like. I was always inclined uh, to math. I liked the logic in it, and I was good in math in school. But uh, in, in no way did I have ever written uh, earlier in my life in my curriculum or in my fate that that I should end, or would end up in, in physics. Yeah. Yeah. You still play the guitar, though, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm. It's totally. It's probably as important, if not more important, the older I become uh, than than yeah. other things. So it's, Great. Uh, it's yeah, that's awesome. the most important thing. Yeah. I, I also have a lot of. Um, I have a lot of guitars that I had made, and I I travel to different places where I ask luthiers about how to build the right guitar. I try to yeah, know that every that, guitar yeah. is a little bit different in, in that way, and I try to optimize a lot of things. So it's. Yeah. A, a little bit. I know it's not my area of research. That's materials research and, and materials science and condensed matter physics. That's by no means my area of research. But as a physicist, there are many things that should make sense to you when you're a guitar player. Yeah, From no, I can physics see that, stand, yeah. standpoint, and that's what I try to incorporate in, in the guitars that I have built. Mm -hmm. Do you play for anybody or just for yourself? No, for myself. I have two CDs that are produced for my friends, but by no means mm. you cannot purchase them anywhere, not even <laughs> on the internet. And you don't uh, want to share them? No. <laughs> well, I share them to anybody who's interested, but it's not something that, um, uh, yeah, so I'm. It's not something that I try to make money with. Or, Fair uh, enough. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's just something that I did for my own. I, well, I basically, uh, my wife gave me a, a, one of these little Zoom, I think it's called, uh, handheld recorders. And I thought, mm. I always, Tommy Emmanuel and other guitar players, obviously you need to record yourself. And I never, I was always into playing the guitar, not so much in the technical side of it. Right. Yeah. And so that's why I was interested, how would I even sound? Yeah, mm. and then I started and it was actually surprisingly professional what you can achieve with such a small uh, with built in microphones unlike your, your microphones yeah, yeah. Yeah. so it was quite good and I have a very good stereo I put the CD on after and it's basically studio quality of course not 100% but yeah. I was definitely it's definitely something you can give to other people and they, yeah. don't, and they don't say oh my god what is this it probably felt pretty it's cool something. when you're all done like finished with that yeah it is that. actually really funny that it's like almost like a creative process so I also write some of my own instrumental it's all only instrumental music but mm -hmm. then I I felt after each CD I fell into it I usually do it before Christmas so because oh, okay. it's yeah, a good it. Christmas yeah present. For sure. that's awesome wow so, that's great and then uh I uh, I fell into almost a creative hole. It's probably too much, and I don't want to pretend that I'm a great artist. But it is uh, something that you fall into a little hole mm. afterwards. So what do you do next? <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah, I totally get that. I obviously yeah. don't write songs or anything, but there is that feeling after you've of completed something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow.
uh, forgive me for uh, for paraphrasing a little bit yeah. too, but you were telling me that um, you have your guitars built with the um, uh, with the hole in the top. Yeah, exactly. So the first thing is, um, so it all started for this now more for guitar players, not for physics students, but um, it all started with the fact that when you have a normal acoustic guitar, I only play acoustic guitar, the, the first question is where do you put the bridge? The bridge is the part where the strings are attached to the top of the guitar. Yeah? Right, like on the, on the neck. No, that Where's is the, no. The, the bridge is the where they go onto the top, where the strings sit on the top. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Yeah, and um, the question is, what is the right position for this? Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing is clear in a typical guitar. You have a sound hole. Should it go closer to the sound hole or further away? So mm -hmm. my original thought was always, you want to have the, the sound principle of an acoustic guitar is that the string uh, vibrations are transmitted to the top and the top then uh, is uh, transmitting this to the sound uh, to the volume of the guitar and the air is resonating and that creates the sound that comes out through the sound hole so i thought it was where is the right position where the strings should be attached to the top of the guitar that was the original question i asked many people luthiers and nobody could tell me and then i found a, a person online Irvin samoji it turns out he is the godfather of modern guitar building so mm -hmm. he not only answered my question he answered it actually physics style he said that's awesome he wow. sent me after one email he sent me a chapter of his book which i meanwhile <laughs> bought two chapters everything you need to know about how to build a guitar he not only had understood um, where to put this, he also had written about it. And to take it one step further, he even knew when you now go closer to the sound hole, meaning the scale length will become shorter, or when right. you go further away, he even understood what this does to the sound. So, mm. And I visited him actually later in person and uh, during my sabbatical I drove there after a conference. He lives in Oakland in California. It was an enlightening uh, meeting and because he had understood and, and researched everything uh, so thoroughly and um, he said always that you know the real way the nuisance of the modern guitar is where the sound hole is because what is clear the the whole top the front of the guitar vibrates you want to have this as mm. ma maximum the, the whole art of building a guitar is you need to make the top as thin as possible because then it vibrates better it's not as stiff right but of course there because there's probably 200 pounds of string power pulling mm. on the top you have to make it as thick as necessary yeah it has to be strong otherwise it flies yeah. into pieces yeah so this yeah. is the whole art and people experimenting with other materials like graphite that are stronger and you can make thinner so all kinds of interesting developments but the point is when you don't have the sound hole then um you have much more structural stability because the sound hole is in the middle of the top and mm -hmm. makes it very unstable you have to do a lot of bracing to to uh, put up with it or to, to counter that. Yeah, yeah. So, but of course, and I cannot believe it, a guitar by Irvin Samoji, the beginner's model is like 40,000 US dollars. <laughs> I don't have one <laughs> for obvious reasons, but um, um, he has uh, people like Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Yeah. So even people that are not only acoustic guitar players, so Leo Kotke, of course, Michael Hedges, all the guitar gurus mm. have his guitars, Martin Sims and whatnot. But, um nobody to my surprise I, my point is that several of these people probably can afford a forty thousand dollar guitar if urban samoji would tell me this is what you do i would have him build that guitar right away yeah yeah so yeah. the people haven't done this so he always says you shouldn't have a sound hole there that was the original idea okay. so then i went first now um with uh, asking a german luthier george striebel um, who builds excellent guitars and I ask him whether we can not put the sound hole in the middle of the guitar we can actually put it on the top of the guitar yeah so mm. the guitar looks very different the sound hole is not in the middle it's basically close to your body here yeah and uh, that gives you a lot of flexibility to brace the guitar and make the top ultimately thinner and therefore mm. the guitar will become more responsive so that was one of the things and then there's of course lot of other questions so Elvin Samoji where to put actually the bridge yeah so yeah I have this now always to Elvin Samoji has exactly developed a formula for this it's known oh, where oh, this oh, should yeah. be 
and uh, on my guitars I make sure that this is exactly done it's always the, in the right, right way in the yeah. right spot yeah uh -huh. so a lot of uh, things on my guitars uh, there's another interesting principle the distance from um, the, the whole length over which a string vibrates is from the saddle to the bridge of the guitar so this is where on the near the neck where the guitar is resting on a piece of bone mm -hmm. to where the guitar is plugged into the the end of the string is plugged into the top basically yeah right. so this distance between where the contacts with the wood or with the bone are is the scale length that is the whole um uh, area or length of the uh, um, of the guitar string where it vibrates. Mm -hmm. You can now make this shorter and longer. So I have another. There's another principle that many people have already used. It's called fanned fret because you now um, want to have a longer scale length, um, a longer vibrating length of the low strings, the deep string, the bass strings. Right. Then you get a more pronounced bass. Yeah. So what mm -hmm. you do is you tilt the uh, oh, okay. the yeah. guitar here, the, the bridge looks immediately a little off and then the frets, which are the, the where you put your fingers in mm. between, they are not perpendicular to the strings anymore, they are tilted a little bit. Because, oh, okay. yeah. And you do this of course okay, according to exact formulas because you want to still have this all in uh, perfectly in tonation. Mm -hmm. This is not so easy to do, but it's clear that you the idea is you make the scale length longer for the lower strings and shorter for the high strings. This gives you more, I like to play mm. blues and finger styles, so it gives you yeah. more bass response on the wow. low strings, which is what you would want for, say, blues, yeah. a real stomping blues should have more emphasis yeah. on the bass. Yeah. That's fascinating. Wow. Yeah, so a lot of, and I, I'm playing my guitars every day and I'm totally fascinated by it. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's uh, yeah. really uh, very rewarding. I find there's nothing quite like it where you can get lost in and um, you take your mind off things, you mm -hmm. only emerge into the music and it's really, really great. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. I play a little bit, um, nothing, uh, nothing noteworthy. And um, I stopped playing for a bit and forgot all the songs I knew. Like yeah. I just, just learned riffs and stuff like that. But yeah, exactly. yeah, that moment when... Um, when you get it down or like when you've figured it out and you just like you you stop playing and it's just kind of happening that's yeah, a really exactly. cool feeling that it's is really so uh, exactly right and so i'm always <laughs> in awe of these moments or when you find something new and what i try to also convey to all my students is you know there is it's basically like there are certain conservation laws in physics that the energy is always conserved the momentum the charge yeah and there are something similar <laughs> that I uh, expand freely to, to normal life. And that is, you don't get a reward without putting some work into it. Yeah. yeah? So that's basically what you just said. Yeah. yeah. You have to invest something, then also the reward is larger. And people always want the reward, just come like the muse kisses you. That's very rare. Yeah. Yeah. For most people, it doesn't happen like this. Yeah? Yeah. So I was listening to a podcast actually recently, and they, um, they were talking about that. And he was talking about, I can't remember who the host said that, he heard say this, but um, it was a, a musician who believed that you had to go and find the muse. So it wasn't something you could just wait for. Even if you were putting in the work, you had to, he believed this person, I guess, you had to set aside time and go and find the muse. You had to set up your work around it. So if you're playing the guitar, you have to really work at yes. getting towards it. And then once it's happening, it's rewarding. Like you said, you put in the work. But you can't, there's no just like, oh, it'll just happen today. Like, exactly. You know, and of course, the, the big difference for people is, first of all, people have different levels of talent. That's one thing. But then still, even then, um, the amount of time that people put in is actually can be quite significant. You know, there's mm -hmm. always this number floating around any hobby that you want to develop. You have to sink into it. Uh, probably not the right expression, but something like in the order of 10,000 hours. Yeah. yeah, And then you can, and of course this scales largely also with, with your with your talent. So I mean, I, I always admire, especially flamenco players, gypsy players like Django Reinhardt and, and people that are just so gifted. Yeah, mm -hmm. know, Django Reinhardt, for example, is one of my great idols. He's arguably one of the top three or five jazz influence musicians of all mm -hmm. time. And he couldn't read notes. Yeah, so it, it just the whole time. The whole time he oh, could. Wow. Um, he couldn't even read or write. He was a gypsy, yeah. um, and he uh, revolutionized that kind of music. Oh, wow. There's still now whatever ninety fifty something. He died. So seventy years later, there are still people going and having festivals at his uh, gravesite <laughs> in, in France. It's crazy. So they, these people were so talented. Yeah, for most people. 
and I'm one of them, it's not so much a music about the talent, it's more about the hard work, but then mm -hmm. it's still very rewarding. And even uh, great players like Tommy Emanuel, so I went to a number of his concerts, he always stresses how much time he would put in, you know, when he, before he actually was a guitar player, he worked in construction, he would work on guitar boogie all night long, and mm -hmm. then in the morning, without going to sleep, probably occasionally go to, to the construction site, try to not hurt, hurt his fingers, yeah. I'm paraphrasing here now, but to make some money, yeah? but the, the dedication to, to what you really love, yeah. that's, that's what I admire, and of course, the talent, yeah, that is so... The music, some of these people, especially the gypsy players, it just bubbles out of them. Yeah. They, they have always the right answer and the right, it's great. It's yeah. crazy. When you when you look at masters like that, there's there's something about it that it's, um, like, you know, that's, that's all they do is they just, yeah. that's, they work so, so tirelessly at it. And it's because they love it, because they're obsessed. And then, uh, like you said, it bubbles out of them. It's almost when you're seeing a great guitar player or a great athlete or a a great artist it's not there's the separation between them and their instrument or their tool yeah. kind of blurs it's yeah, almost it like one, yeah. yeah yeah it's fascinating mm. yeah i like especially those people that's why i also like the blues the, the old blues like blind uh willie uh, uh blind willie mctell and then mm. um these kind of people that do like 1920 mississippi john her to to 19 whatever 50 this time, the people often couldn't read or write. They only expressed. They had, of course, day jobs, and the the it's so heartfelt the music, and yet so so gripping. And mm -hmm. that's what I especially like. I don't like just only the technical aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way too. I mean, I I listen to a lot of um, mainstream music. Like, not I don't listen to, to be honest with you, a whole lot of technical music. But there's something about like if there's like a pop song or like an R&B song or a hip hop song that comes on and it's just, it's only got like one aspect to it and yeah. it's very flat and it just, it kind of seems like something the artist just kind of pushed out. It's not as good as when you can tell that like the producer came to work, the yeah. artist came to work, who the, the lyricist came to work. Yeah. Like when it all is coming together, yeah, it's, exactly. yeah. yeah. yeah it's fascinating. It's, yeah, that's a big, uh, the big um, aspect of joy. I think mm -hmm. anybody who has ever played an instrument, doesn't matter at which level you're at, I uh, have a friend my, uh, here who play, just picked up guitar uh, a few years ago. Yeah, so that's of course difficult then at an older age to learn more. Mm -hmm. And um, but he still enjoys it the same way. <laughs> yeah, one like you said with the scalability, it's just just like that uh, that feeling of getting just better each time. Is so yeah. much because you go from like not being able to like I remember when I could I couldn't even like form a G chord with my fingers. Yeah. My hand was so like you just couldn't do it. And now. It's easy. It's just a G chord, and then like you learn a new song, and you just or you learn a new skill or a new scale, and you just progressively get better and better yeah. and better. And then you look at where you've come from, and it's, it's it has to be. Uh, you have to. People have to be warned that um, I, for example, I have even created a gigantic uh, YouTube document with all my videos. Uh -huh. Yeah, that uh, that I watch, and uh, YouTube is a gigantic inspiration to yeah. see what other people do. However. You should not get depressed <laughs> by it because no matter what you're trying to achieve, um, there is, even at the beginner's level, of course, also at the professional level, there's always a, an uncountable number of people who do it as well or better. Mm -hmm. So that shouldn't, it, it, it really, what, what, what it brings out the music is it has to reside within you. The, the progress, you have to be satisfied with it. You cannot just get by, depressed by all the people who no. know all these things and play all that well because no matter which song you look at, you will find likely on the internet in some desolated part of the world, some little child preferably yeah. <laughs> that can play this uh, so much better and in such yeah. an amazing way with even sometimes sometimes small hands. Yeah. So that is something you have to put aside. It reflects always back on you. You really need to. This this part was not if I may digress for a moment. This part was not when I grew up. I had a turntable. Yeah. You no know, old blues music at that time was already per se not in perfect pitch. This was before CDs, right. record players. Then there was an imperfect pitch of the speed of the record player. So there was no way that you could find out any Mississippi John Hurt song. Um, today, um, 
uh, I mean, to find the right uh, pitch that he used. Yeah, the guitar was off a little bit, and the record player I was see. off. I see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Today, you turn it on. You have an electronic tuner. You go to whatever the note is, open tuning or not. You're always in perfect pitch. The music yeah. is always in yes, perfect pitch. This perfect. whole thing is still. Yeah. <laughs> it's still the old music fascinates me more than mm. all this. But this, uh, this, it has come a long way. You know. Yeah. And then growing up in Germany. There is basically very little blues, only for the specialists. You know, mm. I hung out always at the record stores, and the people knew me. Yeah. But um, th there were some things. You know, I remember Neil Diamond, who is by no means a blues artist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was something because he could hold an acoustic guitar in, in Hot August Night, a, mm. a good live album. This is no, no not music that I would say today is any in any way associated with being at the forefront of acoustic guitar, even mm. at the time. But, you know, you had to take what you can see. Today, you put in whatever you want, the song, the tuning, yeah. the guitar, acoustic, electric, and you will find it on the Internet. So you have it, access it, to 100% yeah. of it 100% of the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that is uh, quite different. And I think people should realize sometimes when you learn an instrument today, uh, the sky is a limit in the sense yeah. of you find exactly at your level what you need. Mm -hmm. There's, if anything, there's too much uh, of these offers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's something really interesting about um, people figuring things out themselves and like the hard way almost a lot of times. Not that I think that you should learn something the hard way just because, but there's something about people that took something and just had no, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have teachers, they didn't have these like these books or coaches to look at and um, they just figured it out or they did something completely yeah. unorthodox like Jimi Hendrix, right? Like you're just taking something and making it completely your own. It needs yeah. to be intrinsic. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is, of course, making it your own is already, this is already the higher accolades of, of, of being a musician. Yeah. So in the beginning, you know, I, I remember when I grew up, I had always songs. So I don't remember the first songs, but for example, uh, Lindsay, Buckingham, uh, Lindsay Buckingham's Never Going Back Again from a Fleetwood Mac record, that was something, or some that I found in a Leo Kotke record, or when I found a John Fee record. So these are the early masters. And when you had an acoustic song, then I always thought, oh man, when I can play this song, then I really have achieved everything I ever want mm -hmm. to achieve. And of course, this is only a, a little milestone when you play that song and then you go on to the next one. Yeah. So this was always how it worked for me. I had always really specific goals of learning this song or that yeah. song. Yeah. I yeah, I'm I'm that way right now. I just I just want to learn a song here and there and just be able to play something. But I yeah. but it's um it's less of a I'm not trying to be a musician, right? I'm just trying to Well you are a musician the moment you play. The the thing is you don't do it for the attention and uh, that, that other people yeah. need to love it and not even for the public most likely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's for myself. That's yeah. why I play exactly. it. I yeah. just want to get better. And it's yeah. like with all things in life, right? Like it's it's the same thing with your work and it's the same thing with um, just, I think it should be the same thing, honestly, just with your homework, like anything, sorry, your work that you're doing at home, like around yeah. the house, it should, you should um be trying to get better at it. It should be for you. Yeah. It should be something you, you're enjoying and, just some, like why would why would you do something if you're not passionate about it, right? Like if you're not. Yeah, that is of course true too. But uh, you know that the biggest problem today, especially in, in first year at universities, is uh, plagiarism. So yeah, you no, know, I always like to tell people what no matter what you do, whether you want to fly an airplane, build a bridge, or help an animal as a veterinarian, doesn't matter which profession you're in. You have to learn how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not enough that you know where it's done or that you have the book where people explain how to do it. You yeah. need to learn and. The people who, uh, there is a relatively strange observation that many professors, I think, would share that um, there's, of course, grades for weekly assignments. Now, especially in first year physics or chemistry, for that matter, or any other field, there's hardly anything that is new. You will find the Internet provides a solution to everything. Yeah, the answers are everywhere. Yeah, so yeah. the answers are everywhere. Even if you have a new textbook, this will not take half a year and the solutions will be online. The problem is what I try to convey to the students, you betray yourself when you look at those solutions. Yeah, But mm. the, the trend has shifted. So nowadays, I think it's fair to say, especially one has to say some students want to study physics and are in it for the interest of physics others want to do it because they need to have a natural science class and want to go off into medicine or something like this yeah. these people often and by no means all of them but often i think it's fair to paraphrase and generalize 
if I would offer them 70% as a grade and they never have to attend the class, mm -hmm. they would probably sign up for it. Yeah? Yeah. And that is the thing you cannot even, you need to realize early, even if you want to become a surgeon, you cannot, uh, whatever, skip your, the learning the tool of surgery. No. Yeah. So yeah. You well, need to do it. Yeah. There's something very, there's a very big gap between being able to give the answer to something or knowing it and being able to abstract it and explain it. I find this, exactly. I, I have to catch myself all the time when I'm, uh, I'll, I'll say something or I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll just use a phrase and my girlfriend will be like, what does that word mean? Yeah. And then I realize that I only know how to use the word. I don't actually know what the word means. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, you have to, if you want to understand something, you have to actually understand it. You can't yeah. just know how to implement it. Exactly. So. This is actually the key. And there's actually three steps. The first thing is you read it. Then people more or less think they understand it. The next step is let's see whether you're able to write it down because putting it on an empty sheet of paper is already a next level of understanding. Mm -hmm. Then there's another step. You want to explain it to other people. That's why I encourage usually that people should work in groups because it's a whole different story if you sit in your uh, little ivory tower in your room, do it by yourself, yeah. or whether you explain with others, see how they uh, express things and view things. So mm -hmm. it's really important about the exchange of, of information yeah. and how other people view that. Yeah, I think... In uh, I would think that the last step after that too is being able to teach it and that's that um your understanding has to be yeah. much much greater yeah you have to this is actually surprising to me in the beginning I thought always well it must be all routine when I have taught uh, a class uh, a few times mm -hmm. yeah but it's quite rewarding to me still that that's even great. if I teach a class for the fifth time there's always something being brought up by a question of a student or there's always uh, an aspect that I that is also new to me uh, mm -hmm. when I even teach it. Yeah. yeah. So that is uh, this, these light bulb moments are, are quite rewarding. Yeah. <laughs> because you feel like oh there's something I didn't know that's interesting. Yeah. It's a good thing too because you think about with today's access to information, it's really fascinating that people can learn new things when all the information is out there. Like, and you're a, like a master in your subject. So the fact that you can actually, somebody can ask you a question. You're like, I've never heard that before. It's, I think it's a good thing that that can still happen. You know, it's interesting. Not that I think there will ever not be new knowledge, but. No, well, that is of yeah. course always progressing. Yeah, no, but that, that is, I mean, anybody will, there's you know, no matter, even if you're the master teacher in your subject, there will be a person, actually many people, uh, who does it better. Yeah, that's also mm. the first thing that I, how I would distinguish a good from a not so great physicist is, as a great physicist, no matter how great you are, you will always realize there's a lot of people that, by the way, holds also for music, even sports, there's a lot mm. of people who are better. Yeah, because you, the, the one part of the drive that propels you is recognizing your own limitations and limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the bad physicist thinks, and the world is actually, there's plenty of them that think they know all, they have an answer to everything and mm -hmm. should be able to explain it just because they have gone through little uh, scientific education. Yeah. So even when you reach the, what, what's in physics, usually I would consider the rock star status and uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, then um, even these people will know it was to some degree luck, no matter how deserved it was, um, and there are always many groups who do the same thing or similar thing, and they do it probably even better. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is something that's humbling. And at the same time, you should know about it and not, uh, not get too, too detached from yourself and think you know it. At yeah. that moment, you will actually reach that level. You will stop inquiring and pushing yourself. Yeah. There's a, there's a couple like like celebrity physicists that I find are like that when I listen to them. The, what they're talking about is still really interesting. But sometimes when I hear them, it seems like um, almost like they're gloating in the fact that they that they know these things. Yeah, that's uh, that, I think gloating and these kind of things that would have to do with their personality. So I mean, you yeah. can do anything funny and. Uh, but during COVID, I, I had one observation. Frankly, before COVID, I thought always, why, why do universities have all these people teaching when I'm sure there is something in the world, an online movie where a guy that has it all from the, the, the funny moments to the best way of didactically preparing the lecture mm -hmm. to presenting it has everything. Yeah, so this must be close to the ultimate lecture. That's what I thought. 
why doesn't go anybody online to these people who are supposedly the best? Then came COVID and all, of course, with it came all the struggling students who were confined to home, couldn't have social interactions mm -hmm. anymore at the university, not studying with your, your friends and colleagues and fe fellows. Oh, the plagiarism. And uh, after COVID now, I know that it actually to, again, make it really pointy, um, the statement, it is probably better to go to one of the rather poor teachers and have an in-person class, including mm. you getting up in the morning, dragging yourself at 8.30 to the class when you rather would sleep because you watched too much uh, TV last night or sat on your assignments or whatnot, interacting with your uh, colleagues in the lecture and fighting through all of this, going mm. through all this effort. And then even the lecture might not be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that is better than the supposedly best lecture, but only delivered online. So there's a lot to be said for in-person teaching and in-person contacts and interacting with the whole uh, environment that comes in a class, yeah. the colleagues, the teachers. I would agree. I would agree. Well, and it's like you said earlier about um, the reward being good because of the work, right? Yeah. Like if, if you can just throw on your laptop and just listen to a lecture and then take down some notes, and a lot of the times the notes are provided to you even yeah. sometimes and it's like, okay, well... I know this now, but there was nothing to that. I just sat here for an hour. Whereas if you, like you said, if you get up, you have to make yourself breakfast, clean yourself up, go to class. You have to interact with people. Yeah. It's not that these are hard things to do, but it's more work than just sitting at your desk at home. Yeah. And uh, I think it makes it much more rewarding. And you're just, you're more likely to learn things if you're interacting. Exactly so. right. Because besides there's also, I don't know the percentage, but there's active and passive learning. So passive learning would be when you sit in class and you have somebody uh, uh, prepare and present the material uh, for you. That's right, the yeah. passive learning. The active learning is when you're studying yourself over the book. So there is no... Uh, first of all, I would think the people who are good in uh, active learning... Uh, sorry, in passive learning um, and just go to class, gobble it up, go home, and that's all they ever need to do. Those people are, of course, lucky, but this will be less far less than 10% of the people. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's a very yeah, small So percentage. that's why um, uh, when you don't understand that, then you will always go to class and will find it moderately depressing because you think, well, all these people get it. I didn't understand everything in the mm. class. Yeah, but of course, if you are prepared then and use the class already as a second uh, um, uh, repetition of the material, you know, the learning has to do a lot of with repeat, a lot to do with repeating then of course you will suddenly uh, do better because mm. it's not the first time you will. But of course, over the course of a year or a semester, there's many classes, many different duties, assignments, labs, and all of this. So people get lost in um, being always coming to uh, prepare to lecture. So this is a normal problem. Yeah. yeah. No, and yeah, it most certainly is that you have to be learning actively. I remember yeah. my, in my first um, term at the university, I remember counting the amount of papers I had written and like the amount of words I wrote down and I'd written more papers or more, more essays um, than the entirety of my academic career before that. And I, I didn't like it. I wasn't, I wasn't liking it. And then um, I kept writing and I, I was, I did a psych degree. So it's it was most of all of my assignments were writing. And by the end of it, in the last, in the last year, I realized that like when I was doing the, um, the research, I wasn't really researching, but when I was, studying for these papers that I'd have to write and I have like my big year end project and I'd, and I'd hand it in, I realized that I actually knew what I wrote that paper on yeah. as opposed to all the other small assignments that I could barely yeah. remember, the stuff that I was actually putting an effort into. And exactly. Yeah. You probably uh, remembered also a lot of the arguments that you put together and that you actually yeah, exactly. extracted from, from the literature and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you have to abstract your own thoughts and come up with things because that's that stuff is i'm sure people still do plagiarize it but it's harder to like when you need to make a point it's a lot harder to just yeah. get it from somewhere else because it, it has to be you making it you yeah. know so and um no but it definitely helps out with learning so go back way to the beginning a little bit um you said when you uh came back or when you came to canada you uh you got an acreage yeah you're still there yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, why? Why an acreage? Not you don't want to be. In well, the, the idea here. of owning land that I can walk on yeah. is, uh, and uh, you know, I I actually always lived only in apartments in Germany. Oh, okay. If you're not going to the rural areas, few people live in single standalone houses like you have here. Mm. One, for one I've heard that homes before, in yeah. Europe, few yeah. in, in big cities, it's yeah. simply unaffordable, and there's not yeah. enough space. Oh, okay. That's actually now I. <laughs> 
I have one car, but a three car garage. So I, I had people, <laughs> physicists come over from Vancouver. They told me the first thing they would do is subdivide the lot and <laughs> sell off the part with a three car garage. Yeah. So it depends, of course. So for me, it was clear, of course, I also like quietness, peacefulness, nature. So all of mm -hmm. this, there's a lot of benefits with it um, that I think are associated with an acreage. But um, Canada is, in, in fact, I know now that in Germany, and in all over Europe, people kind of romanticize uh, Canada in the way that uh, I think they always envision if now this room where we have this interview would open and uh, whatever, a cold river would come through because of something, then you know, the German would uh, carefully fold up his designer suit, put it somewhere and try <laughs> to call for help, <laughs> while the Canadian would actually put on his North Face jacket and jump on the... Uh, jump on a floating uh, uh, lumber and, and yeah. whatever, get to the, get, swim to or uh, float to rescue. So yeah. the, this is this, this uh, uh, simplified the, the picture that people have of, mm -hmm. of Canada. So it's a country of nature. And of course, it's clear, you know, this is, uh, I think the second largest country in the world has only 30 something so. million people, 32 yeah. million people. So yeah. this is incredible, the density. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, I, I point always out that Germany uh, even the reunited Germany is now, I think, a uh, little bit larger than half of the size of Saskatchewan. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, but it has 80-something yeah. million people compared to 30 million people. And when you now compare to Saskatchewan, which I did yeah. area-wise, you have to compare to 1 million people versus something 82 million or 80 million. Yeah, so this oh, my is, goodness. You can imagine yeah. that uh, there, there's, of course, I mean, Netherlands are even more densely populated. Yeah. Than, and suddenly everything becomes a problem. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, I, it's never been put into perspective that way for me. That's crazy. But yeah, Canada, it, it well, is. There's one thing, two things that are funny. So there was recently this unfortunate attack with a, with a stabbing. Yeah. And uh, people in Germany thought always, how close is this to you? Yeah? And then uh, <laughs> the other thing is, so they, they, people cannot comprehend the distances. Yeah? And every, yeah. you know, that there's air quality here that comes a few years uh, suffering a little bit in Saskatoon because of the forest fires. Yeah. And they can be actually, I've seen them because they came from California. Typically, they come from Alberta or even British Columbia. Yeah. And so I've told my mother was always on the, when I talked to her on the phone, oh my God, what's with your house? And I said, no, <laughs> you have to imagine the fire is in Greece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you Pretty are in much, Germany. Yeah. This is basically almost the distance. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that's so crazy. The people cannot uh, the, the the spaciousness of the country is something that I still uh, struggle with. In fact, <laughs> I came today two ten minutes early. It's not because my German punctuality. It's I still <laughs> I look at the map and I still cannot comprehend how quick, yeah, how quick it is in Saskatoon yeah. always to get anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Especially in a city of um like what three hundred thousand now. Like the the freeway system is not great, but it's not so bad that like the traffic's never. Yeah. too too crazy yeah. like yeah it's, it's nothing i mean I, we, we used to go to berkeley this, you have to go basically with my graduate students i spend actually times when we uh, berkeley is basically you have to go in san francisco is all about bridges so you have to go from the airport to berkeley this is probably i have to guess 35 miles okay that's mm -hmm. a distance and we had we had trips with my graduate students where we spent more time yeah. Driving in a rental car, the 35, kilo, uh, 35 miles to the from the airport to the lab. Then we took the airplane, including check-in from Saskatoon to Calgary to San Francisco. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is uh, I could not live there. Yeah, no, the it's, yeah, it's no, it's it's so so busy. I was in Vancouver, and then I went to San Francisco this summer. Yeah. Uh, so here to Vancouver and then San Francisco, and um, the uh, driving was crazy. Thank goodness i wasn't driving a whole a whole lot in uh i wasn't driving at all in san francisco but i was driving a bit in, in vancouver and it was just to get anywhere is just so busy and you know so much traffic and there's so many lanes and this yeah, is a much better size in, in my opinion i like i like yeah well if you don't like spending wasting your time in traffic and you know, then it's uh I hated, for example, our trips had to be entirely laid out to the traffic problem in San Francisco because you have yeah. to go from Berkeley to the airport over uh, over several bridges, mm -hmm. toll bridges and often. And so it turns out that we had to, you cannot leave on Monday morning when you have a 11 o'clock flight out of San Francisco. It's no. not possible. Yeah. <laughs> you have to leave at 
six in yeah. the morning. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a long so time. So you would take typically Sunday morning the flight because then nobody's up at that time, and your yeah. cruise through it takes you fifteen minutes or twenty minutes to get to the airport. Yeah. yeah. So. I remember my um, my dad telling me a story of um, before he worked where he works now. He um, uh, he was with a company and they wanted to transfer him to Prince Albert. Yeah. And they um. He was like, yeah, I'll just have to clear it with my wife. Just to make sure. And they were like, why? Like, it's... He was like, it's another city. Like, it's not... I would have to drive to... And they... they did, but they, for them, whatever city they were, their commute times were like an hour, an hour and a half. And so it's just... Yeah. That's a normal drive through their city. But it's like here. It's like, no, I would have to... I'd have to... I'd be moving to another city if I made a drive that long. Yeah. I'm just like, my commute... I work on the other side of the city. My commute's 20 minutes. I can't but, imagine it being an hour and a half. I have a friend in Tokyo who commutes every day in one direction to work for two hours every oh day goodness. in public transportation, of course. Yeah. But imagine that. I mean, you have to find a really nifty way of whatever, standing in the train and uh, yeah. reading a paper or something. Right. Well, and then you take an eight-hour workday and you put four hours total of commute on it. Like, what it do all you... becomes about organization. Yeah. 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 No, I... Um... He passed away already, so I hope it's not because of the commute. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Oh, I'm sorry for your loss, yeah. but um, no, Saskatoon is Saskatoon is good, and I, the distance in Canada is nice too. I I I've always liked it being so open. I just, but it's all I've ever known. So, but I I, I really like. Well, it. I find it fascinating uh, because of, I think it's partly because of the distance, and of course partly because the travel agents offer it. But when you see a North American tourist in uh, in Europe, they do these kind of trips that I find unfathomable. <laughs> that it's like, oh, we do uh, in the morning, we do Switzerland. In the afternoon, we do Austria. And yeah, tomorrow, we have a whole day for Germany. <laughs> yeah? So, I mean, any city you want to go at, you can, when you want to live there and see how it feels or get a little bit of an impression how it's like, you need mm. to spend a few days there, let alone then you know only something about that city not that country yeah. yeah so i find it's remarkable yeah i mean people have more vacation but it's uh, i cannot imagine that you would do austria and you cannot even do one museum in vienna in half a day let alone yeah. austria yeah so yeah i think people probably just get caught up in the fact that you can get around to so many different places they're like oh it's so much closer together so we should see all of it yeah. i imagine that's probably that i was like just because something is a certain way doesn't mean you need to take advantage of it yeah. like you said you just stick around and yeah see it so um on your acreage you i remember you t saying the last time that we met or the first time that we met that you have a garden it's like yeah. you grow like all yeah. of is it, was it all of your own food or no well we don't have cattle and we don't <laughs> yeah, well, have yeah, milk okay. and all of this but I, uh, yeah right now we are fighting with a deer that ate for example a huge part of the tomatoes oh no so i don't uh, do much gardening my wife does it but uh, so um yeah, we definitely enjoy having whenever you want to cook something, yeah. have it in the garden. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just um, for health reasons? Just trying to get away from it's big just, farms? Or just I think it's of... almost uh, romantic in a way. Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> it's romantic to me to eat your own food, and uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it has not what, the obvious things are not at all what it's for me it's not about saving that money in fact it costs actually much more to <laughs> yeah. water this in saskatchewan and to, to have all this you find better deals when you go to the grocery store it's yeah, just something the, the idea of being able to to help with your own feeding is, is great yeah. mm -hmm. the, the, of course taste I'm a, I'm a food snob or we both are yeah so that definitely helps with it so it is um more the, the, the what i call all these romantic aspects of growing your own food yeah Cool. Do you have any other hobbies? I used to play basketball. That was my oh, yeah? uh, my big hobby. You got the hype for it. Uh, yeah, I got the hype <laughs> for it. And I played in Germany uh, for a few years, uh, professional basketball. And no I way. Enjoyed. But then it got a little bit in the way of my, my PhD when we didn't have a Bundesliga. It's called the, the high league team uh, in the city that I was studying anymore. And I had to drive to Göttingen. Um, which is every Wednesday. I couldn't participate. They practice every day, but I would. Uh, there was a lot of time sunk into this. So, but then I had also the other point at the time that always bothered me. You know, you always uh, have some problems with your fingers because people try mm, to yeah. strip the ball away from you, or you don't catch it quite right. So that was always interfering with my guitar playing. Uh, even yeah, uh, even enough. in Saskatoon, I played in two teams. And I enjoyed it a lot, but then COVID basically put a halt to that, and now I haven't picked up. But I, there is a natural 
time when you mm-hmm. cannot do it anymore. All my friends that played professionally, also none of them, very few of them still play basketball. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is one aspect. But I, that's something I, de- I definitely enjoyed, the camaraderie with the people when you yeah. were... Yeah, oh, that was really something I will always cherish. But there's a time for everything now. Um, I rather sit at home and play my guitar instead of going out for whatever. Some here in, in the old Farts League in, in Saskatoon, uh, it was uh, at nine o'clock. The games would start. <laughs> this, this, this is normal in, yeah. in, in in Spain or in Italy. People go for dinner starting at ten with a little children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, here now, and especially in winter, this was uh, uh, put a toll on everybody and people. Uh, that was uh, was not really great. So it was yeah. basically past all our uh, people's bedtime <laughs> at that's some funny. point. Yeah. Well, no, that's good. That's a good way to look at it, though. There's a lot of people that um they uh, once they've given up their sport or been forced to retire, there's a lot of people that try and live vicariously through it, and I think it can be um. Uh, it's to the detriment to a, for a lot of people. So it's good that like once you know that you're done, it's, it's a good thing. But yeah, it's not that. Yeah, I, I would probably rather still do it, especially you know you know um, the older you get, the more the the preachers uh, of the health get mm-hmm. to you. Like you need to maintain blood pressure, cholesterol, and and all these things. Yeah. You know, and but of course. Is only so much uh, yeah, you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, de- definitely, COVID I think put a big damper on this. I, d- I haven't even checked whether the the recreational leagues in Saskatoon have opened again. Mm. Yeah, I think there was. Oh, I don't know if this was recreation. I think there was something going on previously in the summer, but I don't know if it was a rec league or not. I see. Well, yeah. uh, there were yeah. all the, the Saskatoon is actually for such a small city with. They have an amazing, yeah. I think it goes A to F or so, if I remember correctly. At the time, it mm. used to go the different leagues. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then there's also an, uh, for, for over 35 a league. Mm. So they, uh, for a city of that size, I thought it was amazing yeah, that, pretty they, good. that you have so many leagues. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. You just stay active any other ways then or just... Uh, yeah, just I, I purchased uh, during COVID it was difficult to get my hands on an e-bike because oh, I yeah. live a little bit outside of the city so I would bike to to university. Of course, the problem is you can only do this. You would bike from your acreage yeah. to the school? on yes. a, like 35, a no- 34 kilometers every day but it's an e-bike so I mean not... Oh, okay, so you weren't doing this before? The oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, at that time I still played basketball you know, before yeah. basically yeah, before COVID hit I, I, I forgot about the exact here but I stopped but um, so now I had to stay active but still I haven't found anything for yeah. the winter I, <laughs> I uh, my wife did order an extra large sized yoga mat for me <laughs> I, <and> this <laughs> is going to be yoga. my I'm always joking about this my recreational program I have no idea what I do when the yoga mat is going to arrive yeah but the plan is at least there that I do some sort of exercise in mm-hmm. the winter yeah, yeah. But, uh, have you ever done just yoga? Yeah, I went with a friend of mine, a chemistry professor, to I think one or two yoga classes, and we were overly confident. We purchased a 10, uh, 10 events ticket, and we went to one. He fell asleep, and I mm. couldn't get adjusted to it because at the time I don't want to mention the studio, but they played all this music. Yeah. So yoga was to me to a retreat to yourself, quietness, and mm-hmm. nobody speaks. And the people were constantly asking, oh, I like this song. Who is that? Really great. Yeah. So the instructor would go around and they had a chat about music. That was uh, quite the opposite of what I expected from yoga. It, no, fair enough. I'm yeah. sure it was embedded in the title. It was not hot yoga. It was probably musical yoga. I don't know what it was, but it <laughs> uh, was something I, at the time, it was not for me. And um, I don't know i would like to do something at home but i don't have to drive yeah. back into the city again yeah no fair enough have you have you ever done hot yoga too yeah. no um but of course the idea of hot yoga is immediately appealing to me because yeah. you sweat more and you <laughs> it's pretty it's, it's yeah. pretty hard it's yeah, it's, it's I know. but it's yeah. it's awesome i did it a yeah. few times yeah but yeah it's great yeah, but that's something you in yoga you have to like everywhere you have to become good at it you need to have proper instructions yeah, of course, yeah. and then you need to be able to do it yourself at home but i right now i would like rather have something which i can do at home yeah but the problem is when you have uh, here of course most people just go to the gym i once you have played basketball in front of audiences and tournament and for competition mm-hmm. then you cannot just go whatever watch cnn and being on a treadmill and yeah. then going home this is something i cannot get myself no matter what my uh, family doctor would say or <laughs> advise. This is something that is never. Yeah, it definitely anything. does not replace a sport. No, no exactly. Right? Yeah, but um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I go to the gym, but and I and I played sports before, but it's not like I would never compare going to the gym with like yeah. football or wrestling. Yeah. I guess yeah, it's not. Right. Well, I got to get you out of here. So, thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much for being on. That was that was great. And you're um, welcome. I know you're a very busy guy with school, so thanks for taking your time out of your day. Oh, my pleasure. Right. Thank you so much. Of course. Great. Or is there anywhere um, that you'd like to direct people if they're trying to look for a research supervisor or? Um, well, you can get in like the Department you? of Physics. You go to the University of Saskatchewan, then you type in Department of Physics if you're interested in physics. You okay. of course can type in any other department, yeah. and then um, there is uh, depending on the professor, they have a more or less elaborate website that would direct you to. Um, I would give you one advice, and that is, uh, today I observe that young people always need to be basically what I call kissed by the muse. So even if, uh, if they are presented with a research topic, they will always think, is it quite the right thing for me? Is it what I want to do for the rest of my life? And the point is, you shouldn't always expect only that something interests you. At some point, you need to stick with it, run with it. And once you get deeper involved into the subject then it will interest begin to interest you more so it's not always people today have this expectation is uh, some sign from from heaven and this is the topic that you will want to do and unless you had this moment which nobody ever has mm -hmm. unless you have this moment they think oh i haven't really found my area yeah the yeah. opposite is true once you work at it, you pretty much can make any area your own. Yeah, it's it. about yeah. the success that you have that will motivate you further, propel you further, and will make you want more. That is really the, the message uh, that I, I would send. Not so much waiting for a topic to grab you. You need to grab the, uh, the topic. Well, I think that's a great message. I had one more question that yeah. I almost forgot to ask, but I think you just answered it. It was going to be, uh, if you could leave all, your, all of your students with one thing, what would it be? But it sounds well, like... it would be pretty much uh, this thing um, that um, what is interesting, you know, a, a supervisor and uh, the graduate students, the undergraduate students, I don't form really bonds with. I have them in class, typically one class only, mm -hmm. and then they move on. But with the graduate students that stick for a master's, typically one to two years and PhD, three to five years for a longer time. These people I have bonds with for the rest of my life and I still am in contact with most of my students. Nice. So, and of course, for me, it's very interesting to see in which different areas they end up with. And the area of physics is especially an area where you're trained as a generalist. So my, I actually, when I go home, I have a uh, online conversation with uh, Brad, my former uh, PhD student. He is now, he did a lot of research things in Germany and the Netherlands and now he's basically um, a financial advisor or stockbroker for, oh, yeah. for a different company in uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, so oh, he, cool. the computer skills, he needs to develop um, algorithms that help predict that others oh, work wow. at other synchrotrons in New York or in Germany, two yeah. of my students. So they, there's a, it's a extremely large portfolio of jobs as a physicist that you will or you can end up with mm -hmm. so it's not the right way of starting to think about where will i end up you cannot you cannot look into the future and especially in physics you uh, will not know um which area it takes you to yeah because mm -hmm. the the generalist or very general training makes you feasible for a lot of different things. You can work in a band in insurance, you can work in a programming company, you can work in a research lab at a synchrotron, you can do uh, a lot of different things. Yeah. And that is something that should not obstruct you. My point is to hammer at home on one message, keep all your options open. That's my mm. one advice. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Good. Alex. You're welcome. <laughs>